Hey, Tom Ray from Tom's Big Spiders here. A couple months back, I did a genus review for P. Letheria species. I've made no bones about the fact that P. Letheria are probably my favorite genera of spiders, in the very least, my favorite genera of tree dwelling or arboreal spiders. However, there's another genus of tarantulas that I absolutely adore, which are the Formictopus species. Anybody that's been on my channel or on my blog has undoubtedly seen me gush about these guys. And it's been great lately because just even in the past couple weeks, I've had several people contact me saying that they were picking up their first Formictopus, which makes me very, very happy. Um, unfortunately, they kind of have a reputation as being the poor man's Pampabedius. Pampabedius are known for being big, large, colorful spiders. And for Formictopus, a lot of people hear that they're just brown, hairy, ornery spiders. And unfortunately, that's what kept me away from them for a while, because some of the things I had read about them several years ago were not particularly flattering. However, I took a chance, finally got a couple slings from Jamie's tarantula several years ago, and immediately fell in love with that species. The conceratus are amazing. They start off as little blue slings, and before you know it, you know, you have a large, hairy tarantula on your hands. And so for people that are impatient and really want a big tarantula very, very quickly, these guys are ones I usually encourage them to check out. Granted, they do have that epic attitude that everybody talks about. I've been very excited with mine and that mine are pretty much pet rocks. I don't get a lot of threat poses for mine. I have I never had one charge me, but I'm apparently in the minority on this. Still, I did pick them up thinking they were going to have attitude, and it, I love spiders with attitude, so not a big deal. So what I'm about to do is go through and kind of look at what I keep and talk a little bit about, about each of these species or subspecies, and I should probably go species because the genus of Formictopus is a mess. They really need somebody to go in and check out these species, define them, and revise the whole taxonomy of them because they are a total disaster area. Um, just look at how many different uh, Formictopus species are offered as purples. There are many. So what I'm going to do is go through the basic husbandry on them and then go through my collection. I'm also going to reference an article that anybody interested in Formictopus should get a hold of. It's called the genus Formictopus and its hobby nomenclature. It came out in one of the British Tarantula Society journals and I'm going to give a shout out to the British Tarantula Society. Any serious hobbyist should really check them out because their journals are amazing. It's a great resource. There's a lot of great people over there you can talk to. And it's very inexpensive, especially if you pick the online version where they basically send you PDFs of their journals as opposed to print. So I'm going to stop talking now. I will be back at the end of the video to close it out. But please enjoy this genus review of Formictopus. First up is Formictopus cancerides. The distribution of this species is listed as the Caribbean to Brazil, although it's most specifically concentrated in Hispaniola, which includes Haiti and the Dominican Republic. This species has been in the hobby since the 70s, when ornery wild-caught specimens frequently entered the pet trade. Saddled with the common name Haitian Brown, this large and spirited spider is anything but a big brown hairy tarantula. Slings start out as a gorgeous shade of blue and go through several striking color changes as they mature. Adults sport bronzes, maroons, and even purples. The species has a well-earned reputation for its fiery and abrasive personality, and although adults aren't fond of kicking hairs, they won't hesitate to toss off an aggressive threat pose or to even charge a keeper. I must admit to being very fortunate in that my three specimens are very laid back and docile. You'd have a difficult time differentiating my three P. cancerides females from my G. porteria most days. The standard model of the Formictopus genus P. cancerides are readily available in the hobby, and slings can usually be found for about $15 to $25. They are hardy, fantastic eaters, and put on a massive amount of size between molts, especially early on in the sling and juvenile stage. My first 1-inch specimens went from beautiful blue spiderlings to beefy 4- to 5-inch subadults in just a matter of months. Unlike other fast-growing tropical species like Pamphibedius or Theraphosa, once they hit this 4 or 5 inch mark, the growth rate does slow down a bit. So these other species will probably outpace a Formictopus. 
Here we can see one of my females, and if you've noticed, I've featured three of them in this one. The third one's coming up in a moment. You can see that brilliant gold carapace with the gold bronze legs. They all sport different colors. I have three totally different colorations on my three females right now. And that's one of, for me at least, the cool aspects of this tarantula, that no two seem to be completely alike as far as coloration. And as we come in here, we go, here's my other female, I kind of call Pinky, because you can see the pink carapace there with the bronze legs, just a, a gorgeous spider in her own right. So unfortunately, they've gotten the reputation for being just big brown spiders over the years, but honestly, in my estimation, they're anything but. Next up is one of my Formictopus species purple females, also known as Formictopus cancerides species violet. The Formictopus species purple is quite popular in the U.S. hobby and is often sold as a separate species than the P. cancerides. These large spiders are known to closely resemble the standard P. cancerides, but instead of maroons, browns, and bronzes, they sport a purplish sheen under a light. Unfortunately, many hobbyists believe that the purples, or violets, are not a separate, undescribed species but merely a color form of the standard P. cancerides. There have been many reports of P. cancerides sacs producing both normal colored and purple offspring, which would seem to indicate that they are the same species. Even in my own collection, my three females sport three entirely different colorations, and one of my cancerides is definitely on the purple side. Even those that hold the belief that the colorations may be regional variants have to admit that the species confusion and rampant crossbreeding of these two colorations has probably proliferated the hobby with mixed young. For those who purchase species purple, it's advisable that for the time being they only be bred to other species purples. Temperament and growth wise, I haven't seen many differences, if any differences, from my regular P. cancerides. Here you can see one of my species purple females and she's kind of wandering around and trying to get out of the enclosure which made this one really fun to shoot. But as you can see mine are actually fairly laid back. I will say the first threat pose I ever received from one of my Formictopus species came from one of my purples. I had one that was particularly high strung and had that famed Cancerides attitude. But as you can see walking around here, the purple on these guys is more of a muted purple than one of the species we'll be coming to in a moment. But nonetheless, it's still a gorgeous, gorgeous species. When the light isn't on them, they will sometimes appear to be more black or a darker coloration. But once the light hits them, those purples and maroons really show up, making for a fantastic looking spider. I picked these guys up as slings about three and a half years ago, and since then they've been a little more difficult to find in the hobby. The last time I saw them up was probably about two years ago, although other people may be able to chime in and correct me if you've seen them, but they are a little more difficult to get a hold of than your standard P. cancerides. And here we get a little close up on this girl, and you can see those beautiful purplish thighs, just an amazing looking animal. And here we have one of my Formictopus caudus violet females, or as we're going to refer to them from this point forward, Formictopus species Dominican purple. And we'll explain why in a moment. Several years back, I purchased two rather pricey Formictopus specimens labeled as caudus violets. I was quite excited to have a new species of Formictopus, especially one that supposedly sported brilliant and striking purples and pinks as an adult. Unfortunately, after doing some research on the genus, it became apparent that my spiders were not caudus. The P. caudus is a smaller brown species found in western Cuba that many suspect has yet to enter the hobby. As mentioned previously, Cuban Formictopus species are thought to have small brownish young as opposed to the larger bluish non-Cuban species. Unfortunately, my two specimens came to me as bluish slings, indicating that they were likely not of Cuban origin. In the article, The Genus Formictopus and Its Hobby Nomenclature, by Gudenis, Gombus, and Gunetis, the authors address the apparent mix-up. They state that the brilliant purple spiders sold as caudus violets were likely of Dominican Republic origin, and propose that the hobbyists refer to these species as Formictopus species Dominican purple. Adopting this name would avoid mislabeling them as caudus, while also differentiating them from the species purples or violets that look quite different and are thought to be cancerides. 
My specimens have been one of my faster growing species of Formictopus, easily catching my much older P. cancerides specimens in terms of size. Both adult specimens currently sport a brilliant combination of purple legs, pinkish carapaces, and a dash of light blue on the base of their abdomens. These guys are real lookers as you can see here. Temperament wise, they have proven much calmer than most of the Formictopus species I keep. As adults, they have never given me a threat pose. In terms of looks, these spiders appear a bit less hairy and more leggy than Cancerides or the species purples. And as you can see by these images, this is a stunning spider that sports a lot of gorgeous color and one of my favorites in my collection. These guys were a wonderful surprise when they molted out the last time. And I'll be curious to see if these colors change any as they grow older and become full adults. Right now they're about six inches, five and a half, six inches or so. Unfortunately, I don't have an adult of this species, but here is my juvenile Formictopus auratus. This gorgeous species is found in central to western Cuba and is recognized for its brilliant gold coloration. In fact, the species name actually means gold, with aurum being Latin for gold. As it is a Cuban species, the smallish slings start off a brown color and go through several color changes before sporting their striking adult coloration. Unfortunately, my two specimens are still juveniles and, as such, aren't looking like the golden spiders just yet. In terms of temperament, these have proven to be the most shy and skittish species of Formictopus I have so far. As slings, they both burrowed and stayed mostly out of sight. Unlike other Formictopus species I keep, these guys also seem to be afraid of larger prey items. I had to feed them much smaller crickets and roaches than I usually feed my Formix. Now that they're juveniles, I see them out in the open a bit more, although they are still quite flighty and will bolt to their dens when disturbed. Many hobbyists, including the authors of the aforementioned article, believe that any spider sold as P. platus in the hobby are actually misidentified P. auratus. Some even doubt the legitimacy of the platus name as an actual species. And here we have one of my female Formictopus atochromatis young adults. A similar species in appearance to the P. cancerides, the P. atochromatis generally originates from northeast of Hispaniola and the Honduras. I've heard some folks say that the P. atochromatis is the largest of the Formictopus species in terms of leg span, although others refute this claim and point to the P. cancerides as being the giant of this genus. Unfortunately, at the moment, I do not have two full adults, one from each species to compare, but hopefully in the future, I can put this debate to rest. Like the P. cancerides, the P. atochromatis slings start off as little blue beauties and go through several color changes as they mature. I have three young adults, and I found this species to be a bit less colorful than its cousin, the P. cancerides. In certain stages, I could very easily see mine being mistaken for the P. cancerides, as the appearance is quite similar. Like my P. cancerides, they grow super fast as slings, putting on a ton of size with each mole. However, once they hit around 4 inches or so, maybe even 5, their growth rate slowed down quite a bit. As you can see here, these guys have a more browner appearance than their cousins, the P. cancerides, with a bit of browns. We'll see how this changes as they molt the next time out. I'm very curious to see if they pick up any colors. From what I've heard from other folks who keep both the cancerides and the trichromatis, the atrichromatis tend to be the more brown of the species. In fact, although in the United States, P. cancerides' common name is considered to be the Haitian brown, in Europe, the atochromatis is the one called the Haitian brown. And considering its more uniformly brownish coloration, this is probably a more apt name for it. And finally, we have probably my favorite Formictopus species. We'll just call them the quote-unquote, the greens. Several years ago, I ordered slings of a species being sold as Formictopus species green. Sharing both the love of the genus Formictopus and of green spiders, I was very excited to raise up some of these gorgeous animals. It wasn't until several months later, while perusing arachnoboards, that I learned that there were not only one species of the green Formictopus, but three. Although I thought I had purchased what were referred to as the full green specimens, 
A recent molt revealed a breathtakingly beautiful spider with a golden carapace and stunning dark femurs that revealed a green iridescence under the light. It seemed that my specimens were actually the green femur variety of the green from Ictopus. Unfortunately, my situation underscores a much larger problem in the hobby. Namely, many folks were not originally aware that there were three varieties of greens, which increased the potential for inbreeding. Because these groups haven't yet been studied or described, there was no way to tell if they were color variations of different species, cancerides in some cases, or totally new species. It's impossible to determine how many people might have accidentally crossbred the green species, and one has to assume that the bloodlines for these three spiders may have likely been mixed in some cases. Here you can see one of my spe uh, species green femurs, and there's that green femur in the back. It is kind of difficult catching these guys on camera, but I will say in person that green pops right out. So let's break these down into the three types of green species we have. First, we have the one I'm showing here, which is Formictopus species green femur, also sold as, which I didn't know, and now I have a bunch of them, Formictopus species South Hispaniola. While on my quest to acquire every type of Formictopus species sold in the U.S., I ran across a species referred to as the South Hispaniola. I quickly snatched up three of the slings, and as there was little online about this new spider, I eagerly awaited them to mature so I could see what they would look like. Finally, the time came when my trio molted into their adult coloration, and I was more than a bit surprised at the results. One of my pretty little females now had metallic gold carapace, green femurs, and red seda on her abdomen. It turns out that my Formictopus species South Hispaniola specimens were apparently species green femurs. Had I not already identified my supposed full greens as green femurs as well, this would have been a pleasant surprise. Unfortunately, this now meant that I had five of the same spider. Luckily, they're one of the most striking spiders I keep, so I can't complain too much. And here we can see one of the species Hispaniolas before the molt that will bring the green femurs. You can see it's almost a maroon color. These guys were a lot of different colors before they picked up their green femurs. Like the species Dominican violets, this species grows quite fast, with my slings quickly outpacing my Pecanserides in terms of growth rate. As young adults, they appear to be more leggy and less heavy-bodied than their cousins, and I found that the larger specimens are very laid-back. Others may disagree. My largest female is also a bit daintier when it comes to eating and lacks the killer feeding responses displayed by my other Formictopus species. Out of the three available green species of Formictopus, this is the one I would say is least likely to be just a color variant of the Cancerides. And next up here, we have my Formictopus species full green. Unfortunately, at the time of this writing, my three Formictopus species full green specimens are in the juvenile stage and have not yet molted until their adult colorations. Having seen photos of the full greens, I know they can appear black from a distance but sport iridescent greens under light. As the name implies, these spiders are completely green and do not sport the yellow gold carapaces and red hairs of the other two counterparts. And lastly, the third species of greens is the Formictopus species green gold carapace or gold carapix variety. Unfortunately, I don't have this one. Once thought to be just a green coloration of the Cancerides, this spider is now suspected by some to be a totally different species. As I've yet to find this variation for my collection, I can't comment personally on its temperament and appearance. However, I can quote the authors of the article, The Genus Formictopus and Its Hobby Nomenclature, who describe it as, quote, much thinner than P. Cancerides and has longer legs. The ground color is blackish and the color of the body hairs is also different. The carapace is gold and the legs are full green. End quote. The authors in the article, though admittedly not taxonomists, have seen enough physical differences between the appearance and the shape of the spermatheca to believe that this variant is actually different than Cancerides. And finally, there's the Formictopus species Blue, a spider that I only learned about after finding a breeding pair for sale online. Like some of the other color variants, a Google Informed search yielded very little information on their care, origin, or even appearance. From the few photos I was able to find, it appeared that the females were heavy-bodied with a black undertone that produced a striking blue sheen when under light. 
Always a sucker for blue tarantulas. I couldn't wait for these two to mature. Not just to breed, but to see their stunning colorations in person. Well, my male matured first, and let's just say that he wasn't what I would describe as blue. This leggy beast sported a myriad of earthy tones, including blacks, browns, yellows, and greens. Not sure where the blue part comes in, but it's a darn pretty spider nonetheless. And here's my male now. As you can see, even though he's not blue, it's still a stunning spider. I love the greens and golds and browns and yellows. And here's a photo of the same male right after he molted. I mean, that's a stunning spider. So maybe not blue, but I'm not going to complain too much. As for the female, after her recent molt, she now sports a purplish pink carapace, dark femurs, pinkish tan lower legs with a bluish sheen, and a dark blue abdomen. Body-wise, she's a bit less heavy set than the photos of the blues I had seen. She also didn't seem to match the coloration I was expecting. To say she's not what I expected a subadult female to look like, again, would be an understatement. Although I'm not fully convinced that she has been correctly labeled, this particular specimen looks much different than any of the other species of Formictopus I currently keep. And here's a good picture of her. She is right now in pre-molt, so I'm really curious to see what kind of colorations this latest molt will bring. I will say that when I searched for these guys online, the specimens that I saw were literally blue. I mean, they were black with a light on them that showed a blue sheen. But after posting video of my female on my YouTube channel recently, I had several folks come out and say this is what they would expect a blue to look like. So again, we have to talk about the confusion in this genus. Maybe it's blue, maybe it's not. Hopefully some people can chime in if they have more experience with this supposed color variation. All right, so now that we've gone through and discussed all the differences between the different species, let's take a couple moments to go over the husbandry for these guys. And quite frankly, it's a cinch. This is one of the hardiest spiders I keep. I actually avoided them at first, partially due to the fact that every care sheet I read said they were very moisture sensitive, that they needed moisture. And what I found is that although I do keep my slings nice and moist, as adults, they don't seem to need the moist substrate. I will overflow water dishes, and I'll get to that in a minute. But overall, this isn't what I would call a moisture dependent or refer to as a moisture dependent species. I compare them very much to the Lasiodora parabanas. They're another species that were originally thought to be kept moist, and now a lot of people keep them dry with no issues. So to start off for a sling, I've got three different enclosures here. The one over here is your standard 16 ounce deli cup. Uh, for very small slings, you can start with one of these, but what needs to be said is these guys grow very, very quickly. They can move from a three-quarter to one-inch sling to three inches super fast. Their growth rate is quite astounding as they're smaller. So you may want to skip something this size. This will work, and I've used them before, but what I found is, A, they are going to burrow as slings. So what they're going to do is bring a lot of this dirt up and fill this thing all up, which makes it very easy for them to escape when you pop the top off. They also outgrow it very quickly, something to think about. So you can use it. I'm not saying don't use them, but know that you're probably going to be transferring them out in a month or so. What I like to use instead is I have one of the quote-unquote European-style enclosures here that work great. They give them a little bit of depth and allow them to burrow. And again, these every Formictopus species I've had has burrowed his slings. I just spoke to a keeper that unfortunately was upset with the burrowing, said he thought he was going to get a spider that he sees all the time. Know that they outgrow the behavior once they get to three or four inches or so. So I like to start them in something this size, which gives them some room to grow, means you don't have to rehouse them as often. Also, if you can find these bad boys, these Sterilite containers, I have a bunch of these on hand. Last time I found them at my local Walmart, I picked up as many of them as they had. These are good too, and lots of room. This is not a Formictopus species in there, by the way, but I just wanted to show the enclosure. Lots of room for nice, moist substrate for digging. And again, I do keep them moist as slings, but I'd be willing to bet they do fine on dry. I'm just not taking that chance at the moment. Once they get to be around three inches or so, three or four inches, I only keep part of the substrate wet and then, or moist, and then I give them a water dish. They all have water dishes. Um, a little fun fact here, and I'll move over so I can put this on the side. These guys will burrow as slings, as mentioned, and they love filling their water dishes up with food, I mean with uh, dirt. So just know that when you put your water dish in, you're probably going to be changing it every week. Hopefully you're checking them every week. 
when you go ahead and do maintenance. As far as feeding schedules, the slings, most of the species I kept, unless I mentioned it otherwise in the video, will take on pretty good size crickets, so there's no need for pinheads or any of the fruit flies or anything like that. Uh, they'll take crickets, and even at a small size, like two inches, they will take full-size crickets. At this size, I was feeding them two, three times a week. Once they get to be around three, four inches or so, I slow it down quite a bit. So I'm going to take a second here. I'm going to break out the enclosures I use for my juveniles, and then we'll go from there. And with a little movie magic, we're now back with what I would use for it. juvenile enclosures. Now, again, guys, these are just my suggestions. I have a lot of people that will contact me and go, oh, is a, you know, a two and a half gallon acrylic not good? Use whatever you see fit. These are just to give you an idea of the sizes that would be appropriate for a juvenile from Ictopus species. Now, to start off, I've moved some of my two and a half, three inch guys into the Exoterra breeding box smalls. You can also use the Exoterra breeding box medium which is about the same size as that right there, which is the Sterilite plastic shoe boxes, which have been used in the hobby for years for tarantulas. So it depends. Either of these sizes would work. Uh, sizes would work. Just something to note that this one here, they're going to outgrow a lot faster than they will the one over here that's twice the size. So I would probably put, if I put something in, say, a deli cup, a 16-ounce deli cup, and it outgrew it very quickly, I wouldn't mind putting a 2-inch specimen in here. You'll probably get a few molts out of it. Um, once they hit juvenile size, I've noticed most of them will abandon their burrows. I do give them some cork bark to hide under and try to give them a little extra substrate, a little mound in the corner of dirt. And I do keep part of the substrate moist, but this is the point where I start backing off a little bit and not obsessing as much over keeping the moisture level in there up. They do always have, if you notice right in here, a nice full water dish. And again, you'll notice there was one of the older water dishes over there because they do like to pick them up, play with them, stack them. This one was actually in here last time I checked it. They do some neat things with the water dishes. And of course, they fill them up with dirt and sometimes they're bolts. And then again, as mentioned just a moment ago, this would be the shoebox size. These are great. Not quite as deep as some of the other things, but you can put a good few inches of substrate in here with the cork bark, a water dish, some moss if you'd like and they should be fine and i've used these quite a bit another sterilite type and they go with the one i showed earlier they're very stackable i love them for the convenience unfortunately as you can see they're quite milky would not go with these again they can chew through these if you look closely you can see these little fang marks they can harm themselves there and something to think about again the terrestrials can chew through those mesh vents but these are just three possibilities. Again, I wouldn't spend too much time or worry too much about putting them in something super pretty at this stage because they grow very, very quickly here. So it's not something you want to waste a lot of time or spend a lot of money on an enclosure that they're going to outgrow in a few months. And again, I had one of mine go from about a one inch sling to about five inches in a year's time, just a little bit over, just to give you an example of how quickly they can grow. So there's example of what you can use for juveniles. Again, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that once they hit around four to five inches, usually around the five inches mark, five inch mark, their growth rate slows down considerably. So expect to have what's going to look like a nice giant hairy spider very, very quickly, but then things will slow down a bit after that. As far as feeding, they will take down Basically, almost full-grown to full-grown dubia at this size. I feed mine once a week, either a full-grown dubia, usually males are really easy to pluck in, or I drop in a few large crickets, and they are, again, voracious eaters, so watch your fingers when you're going in there. Uh, one thing I will say is they're not particularly known for kicking hairs. I, never, I don't think I've ever had one kick hair, maybe once. They will, however, throw up a threat posture, and I've had people tell me that theirs will bite without much uh, provocation, so... There we go. In a minute, I will break out what I have for my adult specimens. Okay, now we're up to our adult sizes. This can be anything from four inches or so, depending on the size of the enclosure you put your juvenile in, to, you know, seven inches. Most of mine right now, I think the largest for Mictopus I have is about seven and a half inches or so. Of course, she's still growing. She, she could still put on some size. But here are a couple attractive options. Again, Sterilite containers. They make a Sterilite container this size. It's got purple latches on it. Um, this is the Exoterra Breeding Box Large. If you play your cards right, you can find these bad boys on Amazon for about 20 bucks. Don't purchase them if they've listed as 25 to 30 because it will eventually drop down 
to twenty dollars, which I think is a great price. Now, if you notice, you won't be able to hold as much substrate in this, but at this stage, I found that mine are not quite as interested in digging or burrowing. They will mostly sit right out in the open, which is one of the reasons I love this species. I all my adults or subadult specimens are always right out in the open for me, which is great for viewing. So if you're looking for a showcase spider, this is one to think about. And over here, we have an acrylic enclosure. This is a Jamie's uh, version of acrylic enclosure. Anything five gallon size would probably do. You just want to put it, pack in some substrate for it. And you can see this is one of my species green femurs over here playing Spider-Man in the corner. This size is perfect for her. She's got some room to stretch and move around, but it isn't too overwhelming. And again, she sits right out in the open. I originally was going to put in a cork bark hide for her. I put in a piece of cork bark, but she hasn't used a hide in probably eh, a year or so. So keep in mind, something to think about when you're looking for the adults is they are always, at least for me, right out in the open. And if you get some of these prettier Formictopus species, that's a really good thing. As far as eating, they're just as voracious as adults as they are as slings and juveniles. I feed these guys sometimes the occasional hissing cockroach because they will take down the bigger roaches. Mostly I'm using um, either large crickets or adult dubia. It depends. I'll sometimes give them two adult dubia, one or two adult dubia, usually once a week. Or if I use crickets, we're talking four or five crickets. I fed this young lady five yesterday and she was taking them all down, Billy and I were laughing at her stuffing her face. So again, as adults, I don't worry as much. You can see there, I overflowed the water dish, so there is a moist spot around here, but I will let that dry out in between. My home gets quite dry in the winter time because of the furnace running, and I've never had an issue. I've had them molt right in the middle of the winter with no problems whatsoever. So just something to think about if you've been turned off to the fact that you've heard they need moisture. It's not something I've found. We do get very, very moist or humid here in the summer, but the winter is very, very dry and they do fine. So there you go for Mictibus species, very easy to keep. Again, anybody that's kept an LP, a Lazydora parabana, it's the same basic care. I keep them the exact same way. You just might have a spicier spider than the El Parahibana. But as you can see, mine are little, little sweethearts. They don't react. They don't, they don't get threat poses. I love these guys. And I would actually love them just as much if they were nasty. That's what I thought I was getting into. So there we go. Easy peasy care. Nothing really to concern yourself with. They're very, very, very hardy spiders overall. All right, and then one more thing to add before we end this video, the authors of the article, the genus Formictopus and its hobby nomenclature, point out that they believe there are technically two different types of Formictopus. They can be divided by the Cuban species or the species from other areas. The Cuban species, and this is something I've noticed as well with my slings, are browner as slings, not like the blue ones that people are used to seeing. Also, there are some differences in the spermatheca, and I will put a little illustration up here to show the differences. So something to look at if you're not sure where your species came from. I'm sure there'll be other ones on the market introduced, you know, in the coming months and years that have the old species because we don't know where they come from. So it might be something to look at if you're trying to determine where yours might originate from. So that'll about do it. Again, I encourage people to join the British Tarantula Society and to get a hold of this article. I don't want to put a link up because... It's technically supposed to be their journal and it's copyright protected, so I don't want to do that. But it is out there. People should see it, especially those of you who enjoy the Formictopus species. Um, that said, that's the end of this video for now. If you enjoyed it and this was the first one you've seen of mine, I encourage you to check out a couple more, maybe here and here. Also, if you liked it enough that you want to go ahead and hit that button up there to subscribe to my channel, that would be fantastic as well. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Deuces.